This material is made available to you by or on behalf of the University of Melbourne under Section 113P of the Copyright Act 1968. It may be subject to copyright. For more information, visit the University Copyright website. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for coming along to the University of Melbourne this evening. My name is Mark Hargraves. I'm Pro Vice Chancellor in the Research and Enterprise Portfolio. And on behalf of the university, welcome to um, our campus. And I begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet this evening, and pay my respects to their elders past and present, and acknowledge that these lands have been the site of age-old ceremonies of celebration, initiation and renewal, and that the Indigenous peoples have and continue to have a major role in the life of the university. So it's a great pleasure to welcome so many of you here. Clearly it's a, a very important topic. Um, welcome to Jay Weatherall to the campus and you'll receive a more formal information. My colleagues from the university, um, Adam Morton and Andrew Bray, thank you for coming along. Um, it's a very in, uh, important issue, the energy security and the future of our climate. I was in Beijing last week and there were four out of five days were a clear blue sky. Um, one hazy day, as I recall from a decade ago, um, and a Chinese-born colleague from the United States who's been going there for a number of years said that he's noticed a real difference in the last few years in the quality of the air. Um, and that's probably due to a number of factors, but no doubt China's recent push into renewable energy is a very important um, uh, initiative. So these and other topics will be raised tonight. So again, on behalf of the university, thank you for coming this evening, and it's my pleasure to hand over to Andrew Bray from the Australian Wind Alliance to say a few words. Andrew. Thank you very much, Mark, and um, uh, welcome everybody here. Um, thank you very much, Jay and Adam, for, for coming along. Um, first, of all, I'd like to thank the um, Australian-German Climate and Energy College Energy Transition Hub for the opportunity to co-host tonight's talk. Uh, the, the hub has been a really dynamic and important part of the energy debate in, here in Australia and have really helped kick things along and we've needed all the support we can get, so, so thank you to all the, all the members of the hub. Um, I'd also like to um, acknowledge our sponsor, Clean Energy Recruitment Agency, uh, Philip Riley. Uh, who have contributed to the uh, running of tonight's event. Uh, some of you may not have heard of the Australian Wind Alliance, so um, permit me a, a quick introduction. Uh, we are a community advocacy group for wind. Uh, we promote wind energy not just for the contribution it makes to our clean energy future, uh, but also for the benefits to regional Australia. Uh, by providing jobs and economic activity to regions that have traditionally depended on agriculture, uh, it's introducing much needed economic resilience, uh, especially in times of drought. Uh, also by, by paying farmers and providing support for local community activities, wind farms are pay, really paying their way in rural towns. And this is a critical part in maintaining wind's social licence to, to operate in these communities. So if you're interested, you can uh, become a member of the, the Australian Wind Alliance. You can sign up outside, buy a T-shirt. I mean, who's not a big fan, you know? Who's not a big fan? Um, so look, I'm, I'm really I'm delighted um, to be able to, uh, to welcome the Premier of, or former Premier of South Australia, Jay Weatherall, here tonight. Um, we really are at, at a, a, a fascinating point in the um, clean energy transition right now, and it's largely through the work of industry, community, and political leaders like Jay, that, um, that we've made it as far as we have. Uh, the fact we're seeing so many other leaders standing up to this challenge uh, does give me confidence that the transition is now an unstoppable force here in Australia. Uh, whether some players may like it or not... <laughs> yeah, you never know where they're lurking either. Um, you know, we are moving to a... Hi, Angus. Uh, we are moving to a decarbonised economy, and the speed at which it happens is really the only variable. Um, so when Joe Weatherall started his term as Premier in 2011, 
uh, South Australia's grid was dominated by coal and gas. Uh, there are 1,100 megawatts of wind in its portfolio. Uh, when he left earlier this year, after seven years, um, coal power was gone. Wind had grown to 1,800 megawatts and renewable energy made up half of the, the state's generation. And it will take Victoria, which is a state with three or four times the demand uh, of South Australia until 2020 to overtake the state, uh, to overtake South Australia as the largest generator of wind energy. Um, so Joe Weatherall's critical contribution during this time was that he stood behind this transition all the way. Uh, while household solar has captured the public's imagination and large-scale solar may one day um, overtake wind, when it comes to the sheer amount of generation, uh, it's wind power that still leads the renewables field. <laughs> um, and so for this reason, the transformations that, um, that happened in South Australia and that, they've, that we're able to achieve in the wind space will really be the basis for wind's continued growth as a, that powerhouse in Australia's grid. And so many of the technical and policy issues uh, that, had, that have had to be tackled and the improvements that have had to be made have been made in South Australia. So how to, how to totally replace coal in a generating region with renewables, how to manage ride-through settings on wind turbines during grid stress events, some of these are quite technical but important ones, how to recalibrate the grid to provide sufficient inertia and signal strength uh, when you have a high proportion of variable renewable energy, how to show that wind turbines can supply frequency control and synthetic inertia. Um, all of these things are critically important, seldom reported properly, but critically important, uh, and these, these um, developments have been made uh, in South Australia. Uh, so with no further ado, I'll um, hand over to Jay and Adam, uh, who will um, carry on the evenings from here. Thanks, Andrew. Um, welcome, everyone. Great to see so many of you here. I think we're just about full. So all those doomsday stories I was hearing, hearing earlier about people maybe not turning up uh, didn't come to fruition. Um, I was uh, flicking through Twitter on Saturday, not necessarily something I'd recommend as a good way to spend a weekend, um, but there I was. And I came across a tweet by Peter Hannam, who's a former colleague of mine at Fairfax, and he's the environment editor of the Sydney Morning Herald. Um, and he reflected on coverage of an announcement the previous day, media coverage of a government announcement about drought proofing, uh, and uh, mentioned that ABC story didn't include any mention of climate change. And it gave him pause to reflect about what, ask the Twitterati, what could be done better in climate change coverage and energy coverage? What does the media do well? What does it not do well? What's missing? And there were several good responses. One that struck me, uh, and it was from another journalist, I'm afraid, from Anthony Sharwood from 10 Daily, was that there was too much doomsdayism in what's written and broadcast and not enough conversations about climate that are energetic, relevant, positive, about mitigation ideas, relatable for people. And that's not necessarily a new thought. And obviously we need to tell the harder stories as well. But I thought it was a point well made. And in that spirit, I just wanted to share three quick observations with you tonight before we get to Jay. Um, in July, I was lucky enough to go to the Upper Spencer Gulf uh, in South Australia for The Guardian to report on what's happened up there in the wake of the closure of the Northern Coal Plant uh, in 2016 and the near collapse of Whaler Steelworks around the same time. Well, what's happened, according to community leaders and investors, has been a wave of planned investment, some of it's come, some of it's still to come in process, that puts the area at the vanguard of green innovation globally. There are 13 projects, large scale renewable energy and storage and firming projects, a vast array of technologies that are underway and should they all go ahead, we're going to see $5 billion direct investment in the next five years and thousands of jobs in the construction phase and hundreds of jobs working on the plants as they continue on for the decades ahead. Some of the most extraordinary are being funded by British billionaire industrialist Sanjeev Gupta, who you may have heard of. He bought the steelworks, 
spent one is spending $1 billion expanding them, and another roughly, and he only puts it in rough figures, $1.5 billion on solar, batteries, hydro, to run it and also to feed into the grid. He said, when I spoke to him, that he looked at using coal, but solar was clearly cheaper, a point he said most people were yet to grasp. The second observation is, relates to the same trip. Uh, while I was up there, I interviewed South Australia's energy minister, the Liberal energy minister, Dan Van Hoss Pelican, who's a local member. And as you may know, some of his colleagues in the Liberal Party have not been full of praise for Labor's energy policies under our speaker tonight. Malcolm Turnbull, for one, said they were ideology and idiocy in equal measure. And the State Liberal Party had pledged to scrap Labor's target of 75 per cent renewable energy if they won at the election in March this year. But as anyone who has done it can tell you, government is different to talking about being in government beforehand. And uh, the Van Hoss Pelican now, well, not always, he's always backed renewables as the future, but he also agrees that with expert assessments that the state's likely to meet the 75 per cent target that his party had promised to scrap. The third observation, lest it look like I'm being too self-indulgent, doesn't relate to something I did myself, but it's to a, or about a new, small news story in the Australian Financial Review two weeks ago. Peter Kerr, a journalist there, reported that copper miner Oz Minerals, which last year deferred a decision on new power contracts, was now set to lock in a deal 20 per cent cheaper than it would have faced in 2017. The clear message was that the company had chosen to wait last year as policies already underway state initiatives and the federal renewable energy target gave him confidence new investment was coming and prices would be coming down. So three pretty positive stories, I think, and there will be all sorts of interpretations that people will place upon them. But I think what's inarguable is that they show that on energy and climate, that South Australia, that has been led by most of the last decade by our speaker tonight, is a world removed from the debate in Canberra. So uh, let's... I think we've probably gone on enough and we should get to Jay, and you probably don't really need me to introduce him, but I will briefly. Uh, Jay Weatherall has been a member of the South Australian Parliament since 2002 and was Premier for six and a half years, from October 2011 to March 2018, during which his government won the 2014 election. He was a leader and minister in the longest serving South Australian Labor government in history. He's held a range of ministerial portfolios beyond being Premier, including environment and conservation, education and treasury. Nationally, he's perhaps best known for his strong advocacy for the state's clean energy transformation and his willingness to take on the critics in Canberra. And there was obviously one famous bit of footage <laughs> in a garage in suburban Adelaide uh, where he had a, I'm not sure how planned, joint press conference with then Energy Minister Josh Frydenberg. Um, I'm told that this is his first public address on energy uh, since... Um, becoming just an ordinary MP, and we really appreciate him doing it here with us. Please welcome Jay Weatherall. Well, thank you, Adam, and uh, thank you, Andrew, for the invitation to be here and to the university um, and also the, the Climate and Energy College. Uh, for giving us this venue and I'd also like to acknowledge uh, that we gather uh, on uh, traditional lands um, and I want to pay my respects uh, to Elders past and present. Well on the 28th of September 2016 at 3.50 p.m. the lights flickered in Parliament House and I didn't think anything of it uh, until uh, a few minutes later a rather ashen-faced energy minister walked into my office and said, we're system black. Uh, and I said, what's system black? <laughs> and uh, he said, well, there are, there are no lights on in South Australia, in the national electricity market, South Australian region. Uh, I uh, secured the uh, adjournment of the House. Fortunately, there was a generator in Parliament House. So we had a meeting in Parliament House. Uh, we called the Cabinet together. Fortunately, they were all there because Parliament was sitting. Uh, and we, we went to work and uh, the first thing, of course, we did was to contact uh, the hospitals uh, to ensure that uh, their backup generators were working and uh, with one small example, that was 
uh, of that not happening for a brief period that largely was attended to. Uh, we then turned our attention to other vulnerable people in the community and made sure that uh, contact was being made on those people that were perhaps at home using ventilation systems, those sorts of registered users that we have. We had to be conscious of who was going to manage this emergency. We had 200,000 people in the CBD. That a number of them were trapped in car parks. Uh, a number were trapped in lifts. Uh, and they were obviously causing, that was causing an enormous amount of anxiety. I contacted the, the Prime Minister uh, and uh, advised him of the, the situation and of course our leader of the opposition. We also put in place the emergency centre arrangements. The emergency centre was stood up. It was on the other side of town in the police headquarters. We had to walk there in the rain because uh, it was a gridlock and so the whole of the cabinets uh, traipsed across town uh, to get to the state emergency centre. And we heard uh, the report from the Bureau of Meteorology that arrived at that point that there'd been a rare supercell um, cyclone which had created three tornadoes that had ripped out about 23 transmission lines, really the backbone of the transmission network uh, in uh, the mid-north of South Australia. And that caused a cascading series of faults which ultimately knocked out our energy system. Um, within 35 minutes of the blackout, um, uh, Nick Xenophon, the Senator from South Australia, had uh, found his way into an ABC studio. <laughs> and, uh, and, and he and Chris Yulman uh, then went uh, to work. Uh, and what was extraordinary is that the opening gambit by Chris Yulman was 40% of South Australia's power is wind generated and that has a problem of being intermittent. And what we understand at the moment is those turbines aren't turning because the wind is blowing too fast. <coughs> Senator Xenophon then reported uh, that the Royal Adelaide Hospital was blacked out. That was inaccurate. Uh, and uh, he also warned that people would die but due to a lack of oxygen because of the uh, inability of uh, those pieces of equipment to, to be powered uh, by uh, electricity in the hospital. I mean, the first rule um, that we learn when we manage an emergency is to get relevant, uh, accurate information out in a timely fashion to the community. And here we had a very important national broadcaster and a very important um, leader in our community sending out those messages, such as the politicisation of uh, the national energy debate. Uh, what we do know is that next morning AEMO sent written advice to the South Australia and Commonwealth Government saying that storms were the root cause of the blackout. Notwithstanding this, uh, the Federal Coalition went into campaign mode. The following day, Barnaby Joyce said on radio wind power wasn't working too well last night because they had a blackout. The Prime Minister, uh, rather than offering support, so they had any communication with him after I informed him of the emergency, he went on radio saying that uh, the cause of this was down to the South Australian government because of its extremely aggressive, extremely unrealistic renewable energy targets. Yet at the same time, we know that uh, what was on his desk uh, was in fact um, a, a statement uh, which uh, contradicted that proposition, a statement from the Australian energy market operator making it clear uh, that the storm was the root cause of the event. We then saw uh, a massive storm arise on Twitter. Uh, basically, bring back coal to South Australia. Um, an amazing number of images uh, associated with the blackout were being pumped around the internet. Uh, we tracked them down uh, to a branch of the Chamber of Minerals and Energy of Western Australia. Uh, and uh, then they suddenly disappeared. So, that, so what was happening at this point is that the case that had already been laid down for an attack on renewables, which had become part of the political discourse uh, for really over a decade, uh, was being played out in the course of what was really a state emergency, but, a, but an emergency of, of national proportions. Then, of course, another series of uh, events 
There was a small load shed event on the 1st of December, uh, which caused uh, uh, the transmission line from Victoria to fail. Ordinarily, that wouldn't be a problem because there were two circuits, but one of them was out for maintenance. Uh, that meant that in the middle of the night, uh, there was a small amount of load shed which had an effect on BHP. That was seized upon by our political opponents to also say that this is an issue of unreliability of renewable energy. A further widespread blackout occurred on the 27th of December 2016. 155,000 homes uh, lost power as 250 power lines fell. It was just a massive storm and it, uh, it went through the Adelaide Hills. Of course, trees came down, they hit power lines and that, caused, that was the cause of the outage. Notwithstanding that though, uh, attacks continued to be mounted uh, online, in the media, about renewable energy. And of course the community, uh, all they could see was uh, essentially blackouts, uncertain of the cause, their respected leaders blaming renewable energy and they not having any information to throw in the balance. So um, then there was a, a very significant event. Uh, in early February 2017 in South Australia, indeed across the nation, there was a very substantial heat wave. Uh, during the course of uh, the 8th of February, our energy minister had cause to contact uh, the Australian energy market uh, operator uh, because he had concerns about the advice he was receiving about electricity supply. We were informally advised that ONGI's plant at Pelican Point, which had been ready for entry into the market, had um, not been requested by the Australian energy market to dispatch power. They couldn't, uh, that's ONGI, Pelican Point, the gas fire generator, couldn't understand this because they believed that South Australia was going to be short on that occasion. And they needed sufficient notice uh, to basically start up their generator. Finally, uh, at 5.39, when things were getting tight, uh, AEMO called Pelican Point, the gas fire generator, and asked if they could start up their unit. On G, the owner said they couldn't start up immediately, they'd need four hours. Uh, they called back minutes later saying they, they could get the second unit online within an hour, but by then it was too late. AEMO had requirements under the national energy law to require more reserve capacity, so they sought to shed um, 100 megawatts of power in the South Australian region for 27 minutes in the middle of a heat wave. Um, then something inexplicable happened. The privately owned distributor and network, uh, SA Power Networks, shed 300 megawatts of power because of a computer glitch, so it said. So 90,000 homes blacked out instead of 30,000 homes blacked out. Um, you can imagine where South Australians were at this point. Um, once again, the political forces were gathering to strike a fatal blow to South Australia and its leadership in renewable energy. Uh, and as it happened, the, the Federal Parliament was sitting at this time. And the Federal Parliament, the Federal Government was in full attack mode on South Australia. Every question being directed to either the Prime Minister and the Energy Minister concerning uh, South Australia. It culminated in uh, the then Treasurer, the current Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, brandishing a lump of coal in Federal Parliament in question time on that day. February the 9th, the day after uh, our load shedding event. It was an unprecedented attack by the Federal Government on one of its constituent elements, a state. It's as though um, they were uh, conducting themselves in relation to a belligerent foreign country. Uh, this was a constituent element of the Federation and it was being attacked. And it's no trivial matter to have the Prime Minister of Australia suggesting that your state uh, has such an unreliable energy supply uh, that it can't keep the lights on. Imagine the investment signal that sends to people that might be considering coming to invest in your state. Much of the role of a state premier, especially in circumstances that we found ourselves in, uh, with the closure of holdings and a whole range of restructuring of the South Australian economy, is about attracting inbound investment. And here we have the Prime Minister of Australia saying that we can't keep the, the lights on. 
So in the face of this uh, attack, we had to really ask ourselves whether we maintained our strategy in relation to the leadership in renewable energy or whether we capitulated. Because this was a fundamental point of inflection for us. Uh, and at that point, um, there were also voices um, that were being, uh, that were raising questions within uh, the, the bureaucracy, within uh, even some of my colleagues to say, really, is this the right course, given the pressure that we're being put under? So I, I want to just pause now and, and talk about why we actually took that decision. Um, why we actually took a strategic decision in relation to renewable energy, because I think it's, it's worth understanding how we actually got to this point. Um, coming into government in 2002, we, we had to ask ourselves, what are the strategic risks and opportunities to a place like South Australia? I mean, South Australia is an unusual place in a way. It's a, a really a slither of a population perched on the edge of a desert. And climate change represents particular risks to us. But this isn't, this isn't a, uh, an academic exercise for us. Climate change and the, the way in which our climate will alter fundamentally change uh, the capacity for South Australia to be livable and for, certainly for us to replicate the economy we once understood and had. We also um, took the view that this represented an opportunity because we were abundant uh, in the natural resources, renewable natural resources of wind and solar and we believed that they could be harnessed to give us a competitive advantage and a way in which we could turn what is, has been a traditional source of, of disadvantage for us, the lack of being blessed with uh, abundant sources of fossil fuels, into an advantage uh, by pursuing a renewable energy future. And we did that. We did uh, that in a range of ways. A planning minister, I was planning minister at the time. The Premier asked me to put in place a permissive planning regime. We put in place the most permissive wind farm planning regime in the nation back in 2003. I also approved um, uh, one of the largest wind farms in the nation to be approved up to that point, just on the edge of the metropolitan area. And that was an incredibly powerful uh, political debate. Uh, it, was very, it was very controversial, but it sent a very clear investment message to that sector that if you came to South Australia, you would be you would be supported. Of course, we, we also enacted the nation's first climate change legislation. We put emissions reductions targets in that legislation. Uh, and we pursued international collaborations. We became part of an international collaboration called the Climate Group, where uh, we were one of three co-chairs of a whole range of regions and cities that came together to take action on climate change. And probably one of the most profound things we did, because it, by by 2006, all of the state governments were Labor. Uh, we formed a thing called the Council of Federations, a group outside of COAG where the states and territories could meet together. Uh, and by meeting together, they were able to advance their own progressive causes. And one of the most significant things we did was to commission Professor Garno to undertake a thoroughgoing review of the way in which the nation would take action and respond to the challenges of climate change. Uh, and this was a very powerful step forward. It was the blueprint that was enabled to be taken up by the Rudd government when it was elected in 2007 and became uh, obviously an important uh, step forward for us. And we were conscious of the remarks that were made by Professor Garno in his uh, seminal report which described the challenges of climate change and the costs associated with it but also made it absolutely clear that the advantages um, would accrue to first movers. So those jurisdictions that would move first could gain the opportunities associated with adjusting earlier to climate change. And this for us looked like an important opportunity for South Australia, given that we had so much at stake in relation to, to this important issue. We also um, understood the warning that those jurisdictions that waited for the adjustment uh, to climate change would bear higher costs. The burden of adjustment would be greater the longer it, it was left. So this was um, a critically important proposition uh, for us and, and it, it allowed us 
uh, to take that leadership role in relation to renewable energy. The scientific arithmetic, uh, of course, told us that the world must move to zero net emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases by the second half of the century. And we knew that that had critical implications for our electricity sector, which is one of the dirtiest electricity sectors in the world. That needed to be a critical first mover if we were to achieve that broader objective for uh, our economy. So that's why we took uh, this decision in relation uh, to, uh, to climate change and uh, action on it. But as Professor Garno also pointed out, um, this was a hard message for those people that had a vested interest in the current system of energy generation. A lot of sunk investment in the existing patterns of energy generation. And there's a massive industry, uh, a coal industry, which is wanting to continue to, to grow and prosper, and their social licence to operate is something they're acutely aware about. These companies are accustomed to exercising extraordinary influence on the political process, and they do. Um, and it's no surprise uh, that we saw massive misinformation and attempts to distort the political process. And this is what was cascading on top of us as we were at this, this critical point for us. So statewide blackouts, series of other blackouts, 8th of February, the straw that broke the camel's back, another blackout. But then uh, something happened. Uh, the conversation turned. The public debate um, turned, and it was, it was fundamentally influenced by a number of factors. The, the most profound was community sentiment. People believe in renewable energy. And so when the advertiser ran a poll after the statewide blackout just a few days later, hopefully to do a quick knife job on me, uh, what happened is uh, the results came back. 73% of people blamed the storm. Uh, for the statewide blackout. 18% of people blamed renewable energy. And 16% uh, of people said that renewables should be reduced in favour of coal and gas, which raises the tantalising prospect that some people thought it was renewable energy, but still thought we should press ahead. <laughs> so they're, they're really committed. Um, but so this is the, this was, this was the, the first bit of, sentiment that, that emerged. Then on the 9th of December 2016, Dr Finkel presented his preliminary report uh, to COAG, causing uh, in, in the light of the, the statewide uh, blackout. His fundamental finding was that uh, the, the energy market um, had become unstable because of a lack of investment in new generation. And the lack of investment in new generation was caused by uncertainty. And the uncertainty was caused by the inability of the political process to effectively integrate climate policy and energy policy. And of course, this debate, uh, Professor Garno's report 2009, we had all of that, uh, the, the culture wars, the climate wars going on uh, from 2009 all the way up uh, to this point, uh, where what we saw was essentially the political process unable to grapple with um, putting a price on carbon. Now this was very powerful because it, it contradicted the proposition that uh, our political opponents were putting, which is that renewable energy was the problem. Indeed, uh, Dr Finkel suggested that renewable energy was a very important part of the future and critical with putting a price on carbon. Another element of the debate um, was influenced by the final report on the statewide blackout. And AEMO said in their final report, the most well-known characteristic of wind power, variation of output with wind strength, often termed intermittency, was not a material factor in the events immediately prior to the black system. Then they went on to look at other potential causes for the sustained power reduction have been subject to analysis by AEMO including wind turbine disconnection due to excessive wind speed. This was not a material contributor to the event. So the, the, the criticism that underpinned uh, the, uh, the, the state um, visiting the statewide blackout on renewable energy 
uh, was completely undercut by the final report of the system operator. Then something which uh, was a critical turning point. On the 10th of February, so two days after the, the heat wave that blacked out South Australia, New South Wales suffered a similar load shedding event. This time, 290 megawatts for 60 minutes, six times larger than the absolute amount of power directed off in South Australia. In this case, 1,000 megawatts uh, was offline at the Liddell power station due to issues with the boilers early in the week. And this is one of the challenges, all these old coal-fired power stations in difficulty because uh, of their inability to, uh, to respond. The Kalungra and Talawara gas power stations also tripped off in the late afternoon. And the load shedding in New South Wales was ordered after AMEMO tried to actually get Bendigo and Ballarat to actually load shed. And they were told to get stuffed by Bendigo and Ballarat. <laughs> and so they, uh, they then uh, essentially um, chose to, to uh, tell the Tomago aluminium smelter to, to switch off. And they screamed about that. It didn't affect any houses, but there's such a massive load there, uh, they were able to get away with it. But that was part of their True. Uh, and the, and they got cheap power. Exactly. And, and, so, and so where we, where we got to was a, on, the, on the 10th of February, Coal Ridge, Victoria, New South Wales, was subject to an identical load shedding event that South Australia had suffered just two days uh, before. Uh, and this was a, this was a fundamental uh, shift in the nature of the debate. So what we then saw in, in the weeks and months following that is we also saw steep increases in prices. Um, and what, what transformed from a quick knife job in South Australia about renewable energy became a crisis in the national electricity market. And, and this, this then became a very dangerous proposition for the federal government. And, and as I'll, as, um, I'll uh, explain um, later, what that's led to is a federal government uh, who, for political reasons, were sought to politicise essentially a state emergency, now being the proud owners of a broken national electricity market. <laughs> and this is quite a feat because um, because constitutional responsibility for energy actually resides with the states. And Malcolm Turnbull walked into the most dangerous of places uh, between states that he required agreement, uh, Labor states that he required agreement with, and his um, right wing, uh, essentially, coalition party room. And he was trapped, and that's the story of his demise. Um, so the federal government. Um, uh, was uh, complicit and now they had this really difficult situation. But we were still left with a problem. We had a national electricity market that just couldn't deliver <laughs> consistency for South Australia. And we had a community that was saying, um, we're being told that we can't invest here, uh, the lights aren't on and our energy prices are increasing. But this was the, this was the critical point for us. Um, and just as a, a bit of an aside, on the 8th of February, when that blackout occurred, I was organised to actually have an online Q&A session an hour later. And I can tell you that was the most uncomfortable question and answer session I've ever had in my life. But what it left me with the unmistakable view about is that we had to act, and we had to act assertively, uh, and, we, and we had to use essentially this crisis uh, as an opportunity. And we did that. The next morning I stood up and I said the national electricity market is broken and South Australia is going to take charge of our energy future. And what we did over the next five weeks uh, with that statement um, put out there was to invite uh, the community, uh, the business sector and as you'll see the international uh, business community to get involved in assisting us to find a solution. And we had three cabinet meetings a week for five weeks. We had experts in the cabinet meeting assisting us to evaluate ideas and it was an iterative process. As we evaluated propositions, unsolicited bids were coming into uh, the cabinet from 
a whole range of uh, sectors um, in the energy industry and we were evaluating them in real time. Uh, and essentially what that did was lead to the creation of uh, the State Energy Plan. So the State Energy Plan uh, was a number of propositions. First we gave the Energy Minister the power of direction so that we don't have to sit around and wait for AEMO to work out whether it's hot enough and they need to direct some power on. We also ensured that we had a state-owned generator so that we would have backup supply so that we could respond in circumstances where there were reserve shortfalls. We also used the government's electricity load to sponsor the entry into the market of a new competitor, a solar thermal plant uh, called Solar Reserve. Um, this was a very carefully designed proposition which was to use about 100 megawatts of the South Australian government's load and then use that to leverage the building of a 150 megawatt power plant that could be used in South Australia. And we carefully designed the contract to make sure that that generator uh, would also bid into the market at the same price they are offering the South Australian government. And because of the nature of the South Australian government's load and the load for the rest of the state, it provided a massive benefit. Most of our load is in the middle of the day, schools and uh, police stations and hospitals, those sorts of things. The peak load for the state, though, is when people get home and turn their air conditioners on in the late afternoon. Um, so that load was capable of being bid into the market in a way which would drive prices down and was an important part of introducing new competition into our market. Uh, we also made some steps to shore up um, the capacity for us to access gas uh, in circumstances where we had um, gas-fired generators that were facing supply shortages. So the private investment that was spawned by uh, the State Energy Plan uh, was impressive. New AGL generator at Barker's Inlet, the first to be built in South Australia for years, replacing a portion of an old inefficient and inflexible Times Island plant. Uh, I've just spoken about the $650 million solar thermal plant. And ONG uh, that had uh, the generator that was in mothballs at Pelican Point are now back in service and generating power. And uh, as you've heard, the strength of this plan is that it is, uh, continues to be uh, supported by the incoming uh, Liberal government. But one of the, um, the elements of this process was that we were inundated with ideas about how we could solve this particular challenge. And so what we did was to create a renewable technology fund, $150 million, to entertain these bids. Um, we made a decision through the process that a central part of the plan was going to be a big battery, a grid level battery, uh, which would provide stabilisation services and also give us the capacity to meet reserve shortfalls. So a 150 megawatt grid level battery was the first project earmarked from that fund. Um, and uh, it's worth uh, pointing out uh, that uh, that battery was installed in time for summer of 2017 and performed beyond expectations. Rapid frequency response capacity of the battery uh, left many forms of thermal generation which had typically been used to provide those frequency control ancillary services in their wake. Um, and it's worth reminding people of how sceptical uh, people were about this technology at the time. I mean, it's, now it's, it's regarded as, um, uh, as uh, somewhat commonplace to laud the success of the battery. But this is what was being said just prior to us making this decision. Um, the current Prime Minister um, uh, just compared Tesla's big battery to the big banana or the big pineapple. Uh, Matt Canavan, the Resources Minister, likened it to Kim Kardashian of the energy market, famous for being famous. Um, and we also um, received advice from the Australian Energy Market Operator, who in the same month uh, as we were discussing this, published a report suggesting that the maximum size of a utility-scale lithium-ion battery would be one megawatt. 
we also had uh, AEMO saying just months earlier that utility scale batteries were about 10 to 20 years away from providing meaningful contributions to the grid. These are the expert operators of our national grid. The, Min the Minerals Council of Australia, the primary coal lobby in the country, uh, who uh, quoted um, uh, suggesting that they couldn't imagine uh, a grid level battery beyond 20 megawatts uh, and that it would take one year to design and two years to build. So uh, what in fact happened uh, is that uh, the South Australian Government for about $4.6 million per annum over 10 years uh, achieved a, a very substantial benefit uh, for the South Australian uh, grid. It was called into action by EMA even before the official launch injecting 70 megawatts of stored wind energy into the market on November the 30th uh, as prices soared amid low wind generation and a missing coal unit at Loy Yang A. Um, and uh, once it was officially opened, um, two weeks later, uh, it stepped in when Loy Yang coal generator in Victoria suddenly tripped to illustrate how quickly it could respond in milliseconds rather than the minutes uh, that um, would otherwise be required. And this was critical because um, responding in minutes is the difference between the energy market operator being required to load shed. So it's the difference between the lights staying on and uh, there being blackouts. Uh, we also know that uh, it played an important role just recently when two lines connecting Queensland and New South Wales tripped simultaneously after twin lightning strikes, causing widespread outages uh, in three states and the grids in Queensland and South Australia to be islanded. Uh, South Australia, AEMO acknowledged, uh, was the only state to emerge from this emergency event uh, unscathed. So the Tesla big battery uh, provides uh, these frequency control services, but there's an important uh, financial benefit as well. Not only does it provide these services more effectively and more efficiently, uh, it also introduces competition into a market that was dominated by just a few players. And so it's estimated in the first quarter of this year, the cost of FCAS, frequency control and ancillary services, fell by nearly $33 million or 57% according to AEMO, in large part because of the introduction of the Tesla big battery. Um, so this is, um, has made a very uh, substantial contribution uh, to uh, uh, the South Australian region of the grid, indeed the whole grid. Um, but uh, I think at this point it's probably worth um, uh, an anecdote. Um, one thing that happened in the lead up to the uh, establishment of the plan was uh, the contemplation of a big battery. And I must acknowledge uh, Zen Energy, a, a South Australian company that actually first put the grid level battery on our radar. In fact, they encouraged us to look at one in, uh, in the United States. And so the proposition of a grid level battery was already on our radar. Um, and uh, indeed, I think uh, Zen, who's now been taken over by Mr Gupta, he liked the company so much, he bought it, uh, decided um, that they could have gone ahead with that battery themselves if the rules of the national electricity market had permitted uh, pricing intervals of five minutes. So it's, uh, it's one, of the, one of the examples of how regulation not catching up with, the, uh, with current technologies. But in any event, uh, it was already going to be part of our plan. Uh, but I was horrified to see Elon Musk tweet uh, on the, the 10th of uh, March, I think it was, um, three days before we were about to launch our plan, uh, that he would uh, build one of these batteries for uh, 100 megawatts and it, uh, if it wasn't delivered in 100 days it would be free. The problem is that everybody in, South Australia, in Australia that was interested in this um, basically got on to me and says, accept this deal, it's the deal of the century. Uh, and I couldn't say that we're already, this is a centrepiece of our plan and I, I, it was a, a small problem with probity in, in doing that. So I did the next best thing, I got on the phone to him and I said, look, could you mind, uh, you know, not tweeting anymore because it's driving me crazy. And uh, he, uh, and so then he put out another tweet saying he'd had a good discussion with me and then they all got off my back. Uh, but ultimately he did win the tender and uh, 
Uh, and, and when he came to South Australia to announce it, um, I don't think there's been a point in the history of the state, at least in, certainly in recent memory, uh, that uh, the state has received so much international coverage um, and positive. And in fact, New York Times, you know, 40 million followers, something like um, describing it as the first great engineering feat of the 21st century. This is an extraordinarily powerful set of images and, and helped to some degree to turn around the reputational damage that was done to South Australia uh, by our federal colleagues. So we were, we were very grateful for that. So the Renewable uh, Technology Fund uh, was a fund uh, that not only provided for the big battery, it also did a number of other exciting things. It funded uh, a virtual power station, so 50,000 rooftops in our social housing uh, estate to be linked up by technology and batteries. <coughs> Uh, in a way that will provide a 250 megawatt uh, virtual power station. Another exciting project. And a range of other uh, storage technologies in the form of liquid hydrogen uh, and pumped hydro, all funded out of uh, the $150 million renewable energy uh, project. So uh, this, uh, this uh, threat, this challenge to, to South Australia, which led to the creation of the plan and then a technology fund which essentially was driving innovations and new investment uh, in renewable energy and storage technology uh, had these other incredibly important effects for South Australia. We saw Sonnen, uh, a German battery manufacturer, decide to set up an operation in South Australia to actually make batteries in our state. Uh, so what we were seeing... and and excitingly for the people of the northern suburbs that were grappling with the closure of Holdens in the Holden building, in the very plant that was making cars, now manufacturing batteries. But this is, a, this is an incredibly powerful story of transition. And we're also seeing other exciting examples of transition in Port Augusta, you've heard. There's an incredible image of a coal-fired power station being decommissioned. And in the foreground, uh, a desalination greenhouse, um, sundrop farms, both in the same landscape, um, jobs of the future, the jobs of the past. So this was a very powerful story for our state. And I suppose that's where I, I want to um, really bring this together. Uh, we, we, where we really started as a state was to, was to consider the opportunities that, that uh, bequeathed to us by natural advantages. You have to look at what you have, especially in a crisis. And we knew that we were facing a very significant set of challenges with the closure of our car industries. We also knew that climate change represented an existential risk to our state. And so we wanted to take steps. We wanted to turn, not we didn't want to be paralysed by these challenges, we wanted to turn them into opportunities. And so that's why uh, we approached the matter in this way. We saw it as an example of also to project an image of us around the world which reflected our values so that we are saying to the world that this is a place that values action on climate change. Come and be part of this story, join this state that has uh, not only the intellectual capital but the moral capital to take on one of the great challenges of our generation. That's why we participated in the international forums. That's why we went uh, to the 21st Conference of Parties in December 2015. And the overwhelming message out of that Paris Climate Change Conference uh, was not of um, the nature and scale of the challenge. Of course, that was realistic and it was acknowledged. But it was the consensus that emerged between the nations of the world and indeed the businesses of the world about the imperatives of climate change and the opportunities that were presented to us. And those opportunities are extraordinary. We can become a nation of innovative in energy tech companies. We can use our abundant natural resources to create a competitive energy price and attract energy intensive industries. There's no reason why we can't continue to make things and make things with a competitive advantage by using the renewable energy and turning that uh, into the capacity to have low cost energy solutions. 
Um, the old fossil fuel industries will no longer provide us with the incomes growth they once provided. Fossil fuels have been important uh, to the lifestyle that we've all enjoyed. But they, uh, by definition, are coming to an end because the rate of depletion of those resources and now because of the imperatives of climate change. Um, so what we need to do is to look to those um, industries um, that can take advantage of a carbon constrained future. Um, things like hydrogen for the reduction of iron ore or production of nitrogen fertilisers or of course liquid fuels that are associated with hydrogen, essentially transportable renewable energy. Um, so our capacity uh, to uh, take on uh, the, the challenges and turn them into opportunities has been at the forefront of our thinking. Um, I believe that uh, the South Australian energy future is bright. We've taken a leadership role, we've stared down our opponents and we're very confident that this represents the future for our state, our nation and indeed the world. Thank you. Thank you, Jay, for those fascinating insights into what is an extraordinary time in our national life, as I'm sure you'll all agree. Now, we have about half an hour for questions, and we've got some people, I think, with microphones who are <coughs> going to wander around. So if you could uh, raise your arm if you've got a question and um, say, introduce yourself and perhaps get to the question quickly, if we could. Not too many lengthy opinion pieces, and so we can make the most of Jay's expertise while he's here. Um, while we're um, waiting for some hands to go up, um, Jay, one obvious question um, uh, that was a, a fantastic takes through and in, to, a, to an extent, how do we got to this point? Yeah. Um, I'd be interested for you to reflect on the state of national debate, which has moved on again somewhat in the last few months, and what um, the role the states can <coughs> play in that um, as that landscape continues to change? Yeah. Um, well, the, the, the federal uh, coalition is incapable of grappling with in integrating climate policy into energy policy. They've had about three or four different goes at it. Uh, they opposed the carbon pollution reduction scheme. They opposed the cap and trade scheme. Did they repealed it? Uh, they turned their back against the emissions intensity scheme. Uh, they turn their face against the clean energy target and despite the party room supporting it, they scrapped the national energy guarantee. So I think that's ample evidence that, that they're incapable of, of actually resolving this political dilemma inside their own party. Um, so so you, what you won't see is any um, effective integration of energy policy and um, climate policy to, to assist the national energy market to uh, get the relevant price signals so that they can invest and end the uncertainty. In a way though, it, it may not matter. It may be that the national electricity market has been so insulted uh, over such a long period that a price signal alone wouldn't be believed by the market. So um, it's worth remembering that a lot of the generation that's been built uh, leaving aside renewable generation, has actually been built by governments. There's sort of a reason for that. Um, the certainty that's necessary to make a 20 or 30 year investment proposition, in the absence of you having a, some specific financial incentive or a contract, um, really is, is a big deal. Now, if you're in a, in a hyper-political environment, what shareholder um, would put their money on the line to invest in a business case that could shift from out underneath them. So even if there were to be a credible price put on carbon, um, th there's a really, there's an open question about whether the market would, would respond, whether it would believe it or not, because there would be, especially in the absence of bipartisanship. So where does that leave you? Well, strangely enough, it probably leaves you where the coalition is at the moment. I mean, there's actually a convergence here. The coalition, 
and, and I think Labor are beginning to get there as well, um, are, I think, arriving at the view uh, that um, the government's going to have to step in in one way, shape or form to actually fix this national electricity market. Now, in the case of the coalition, they say it should step in and build coal-fired power stations. But that's still a government intervention. It's still an implicit acknowledgement that the market is broken. Now, Labor wants to step in and, of course, promote renewable energy and an emissions reduction target. But one way or another, I think we're talking about some greater degree of intervention. We're already seeing lots of interventions. Our $550 million energy plan, Victoria's announced a massive uh, energy plan, Queensland's announced. So really, what you're seeing is, I mean, back in 1999 when the national energy market was formed, I think states and probably the Commonwealth thought, well, well that's, now it's over to you know, some degree to the private sector. Interestingly, it's now been dropped back in the lap of governments. Now, unless we're very careful, there's going to be some very big bills that are going to have to be written, uh, they're going to arrive on the desk of governments. So, you know, this is... And, and you know, the, they're already speculating about it. I mean, the, the Commonwealth are talking about, you know, a snowy hydro scheme. They're talking about coal-fired power stations. These are big checks they're going to have to write. Um, so I, I, I think where we're heading is a consensus the national electricity market is broken and possibly um, broken in a way which is not simply going to be solved just by putting in a, a price on carbon and hoping that that investment signal is enough to get the private sector to invest. Okay. Uh, thank you. It's Peter Hansford. I work for the Victorian Government. And you've almost answered one of my questions, which was, does it really matter whether we have consistency in federal policy, given the great work that you and uh, ACT Victoria are doing in renewable energy? So um, to shift the question a little bit, um, how important is it to get industry recognising the economic signals and actually investing in their own energy future? And what can the government do to support that? Yeah, I mean, look, I still think the first best result is to get a functioning national electricity market. Um, and because otherwise... Uh, well, the state, it, it, I mean, it, it's a sort of little known fact, but the states actually uh, do have the constitutional responsibility over the national electricity market. Um, the, and and so the... So it is true that, that the states provide that framework. Where the Commonwealth gets in, though, is that it, it determines essentially climate change policy, so emissions policy. And so it's really those two things that have to be brought together to get a credible uh, national electricity market response. And that's the thing that's bedeviled the political process. So I, I think the first best result would be to get a functioning national electricity market. But the, the question I raise is whether that's enough. Um, I, I, mean, I think you could make it easier for businesses to... Some, there are some regulatory barriers to businesses being able to um, get their own energy needs met. So I think removing those would be important. But I think you're still, for the foreseeable future, going to require a national electricity market which is functioning. And, I mean, it's worth, it's worth just explaining what we did and, and why we did it. We, now, I, sir, I'm, I, sir I'm, I'm happy to answer your question in a moment. Uh, well, okay. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. I was looking forward to answering his question. Um, can I just explain what we did? Because it, we, we, we tried to intervene in a way which preserved the market. We didn't, we didn't, the problem with intervening in any market is once you get a non-market actor there, everybody else starts to panic. Uh, and they also change their behaviour based on the non-market actor. So, you know, I think there's, there's ways of intervening. A modern role for government is not just to do it yourself or let the free market do it. There's a sort of a third way, which is to almost create markets. And in a sense, we've created a new market through uh, the big battery with well, with fundamentally altered uh, that market. Um, and so market rules are important. I mean, if the rules for the frequency control ancillary market had been different, 
we probably already would have had a big battery. It sort of required the state to step in and, and underwrite it. So you need, there's, there, there are clever interventions that can be made to actually get a functioning market, but I think that there's a real problem given the chilling effect that we've... See, what we've done is we've politicised price increases. Price increases used to be a signal to the market for a supply response. Now they're a cause of, you know, to be on the evening news and a cause for somebody's got to take action. We've got a minister that says he's, he's the minister for getting prices down. Now, if you're, a, if you're a... Imagine if you're a private sector investor and you're trying to base a business case, you can see your business case collapsing out underneath you because you might have a politician that decides the prices are too high. So you sort of got to make your mind up whether this is a market or whether it's... And if it's not a market, then you're going to be writing a lot of checks uh, because we'll be back in the business of energy. OK, one over here. Would it be fair to say that the storm was the tipping point that galvanised South Australia into taking uh, responsibility for its own future instead of relying on the, the national system? That's just a summary of the way I've, what I've heard today. Yeah, I, I think that's a fair point. I mean, the, you've got to remember that we, we had a privatised electricity market. And so to some degree, the responsibility for the provision of electricity had, had been transferred to the private sector. But the problem is that the people didn't see it that way. They, the people think that electricity is an essential service and they're not going to let governments off the hook by saying, oh, you know, the private sector are providing that and it's no longer your, your responsibility. And I suppose to some degree we were also... We were trying... I mean, for 10 years, governments like mine have been trying to put a price on carbon so we would get the relevant uh, price signals. And th this is critically important because we, we've sort of... What was washed up on the shore of the sort of failed um, attempts to have a price on carbon was the renewable energy target. The mandatory renewable energy target that started with how it increased by labour incentivised all this wind farms. But what it didn't do is it didn't distinguish between gas and coal. And so we were heavily reliant on interstate coal uh, coming over from Victoria or New South Wales because gas was never switched on because it could never compete. Wind would come on first, coal would come on second. There wasn't enough times when gas was actually asked to switch on. That's why you had a thing like Pelican Point, a modern, new gas-fired power station that was sitting there in mothballs, half as carbon polluting as coal, but because you didn't have a price on carbon, it didn't get any... It was treated uh, the same as coal for the purposes of uh, uh, generation in the market. So the only thing that counted is what gas could bid in it. It always bid in after coal. It never got reached. They started switching them off. That meant we had less... Uh, capacity on our side of the border and we were more reliant on Victoria and to some degree New South Wales. The point you seem to be making, correct me if I'm wrong, a journalist goes for the simplistic answer, but that we've been naive for too long about the role the market can play and where it'll take us. Is that fair? Well, I mean, it, it is a market for better or for worse and, you know, unless you want to take it over and, and own it, um, you, you've got to make it work. And I, I think... Yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of this has been hidden because we had an excess of supply back in 1999 when we created the national electricity market. So that what we've had over the last um, period is about 13 coal-fired power stations close uh, and about 6,500 megawatts of installed capacity have come off. And so, you know, eventually the chickens come home to roost. Nobody's been investing to keep to extend the life of coal-fired power stations because they don't know what the rules are. Yeah. And it's all... And, you know, it's pretty simple. You reduce supply with a fixed level of demand, you get price spikes. OK, I think we've got one up the back and then one down the front here. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, uh, what... what uh, how did um, you um, sort of... Um, what gave you the courage as a political leader to embrace the science and... Um, and, and take this country into the 21st century? Well, <laughs> it was... To be, to be fair, the leadership role was really taken by my predecessor, um, Mike Rand. So he put us on this trajectory. 
I suppose that the point, the bit I'll take credit for is, is not running away when it got tough um, in when, when we had that last blackout, because that was the moment of truth. Uh, and uh, it was helped by two days later, New South Wales having their load shedding event. But, you know, the, the, the forces were gathering to deliver a coup de grace on South Australia. And, you know, it's, um, so that's the bit. To, to some degree, I also, I mean, it was a crisis. One of the advantages of crisis, it gives you political permission to act. Because a lot of politics is caught up in just confusion and nobody's listening and you can't, you, you can't get a proper public debate because, you know, mainstream media is just, pretty sensationalist and the rest of it's, you know, Twitter and social media. So cutting through is hard. When you've got a roll goal crisis, everyone's watching. And so it's a good time to talk to people. And you, because what you get immediately is the why. I mean, the, the biggest challenge in politics is to establish why. The what becomes pretty simple. Once you've got the question out there, and we were able to define the question in really succinct terms. The national electricity market is broken. South Australia is going to take charge of its energy future. And, you know, then we were away. And uh, it, it, it was a really, you know, ironically, an incredibly positive... It became a really positive thing. And uh, not quite enough to win me the election. But it, I mean, I want, <laughs> what, but I, what, I will say, what I will say is this, though. On the last day of the election campaign, I was talking about energy and my opponents wanted to talk about anything other than energy. And if you'd told people a couple of years before that's what would have been happening, they would have been rather surprised because everybody thought the blackout was the end of us. Uh, th thank you for your remarks, Jay. I I'm Chloe Munro and I was formerly the chair of the Clean Energy Regulator and a member of the Finkel Review Panel. So I want to just switch away from generation towards the other aspects of the national market. Um, most of the Finkel recommendations were accepted and are being acted on. One of them was about integrated system planning and looking at the, uh, the network as a whole. And it's looking partly at the balance between um, a future which is largely distributed, uh, following in a way the approach that South Australia was taking, which was kind of independent, state independence as much as possible, or an alternative future which would have a lot, of intercon lot more interconnection, a lot more transmission with renewable energy zones and all of that. And I'd be very interested in your view about how you think the market, that, well, the system actually should evolve between those two yeah. kind of polar opposites. It's really interesting. We had that debate inside our cabinet about... Because one of the first things that seemed obvious to us was just build another interconnector. Uh, there's a long history of interconnectors in South Australia. The previous government, um, just before they privatised, killed off an interconnector with New South Wales, largely to bid up the price. Um, and so we were left without an interconnector. Um, so we, it's one of the first things we thought about. But when we looked at it more carefully, we realised that it was actually going to work against us in the, sh in the short to medium term, because it would actually um, it, it would increase our reliance on other states. So it, it was not consistent with our strategic objective of taking charge of our energy future. And in fact, it could have the perverse effect of actually driving new generation being built on our side of, in, a, in our region. I mean, in, in a sense, what you're doing is you'd have another competitor coming over the border which would alter the business case for, say, a Barker Inlet that our AGL were thinking of building or Pelican Point switching on or, um, or even the solar thermal plant. Um, they would have to take into account that they would be competing with essentially cheap coal coming over the border. Um, so, we, so our plan included an interconnector, but in the long term, not the short term. It sort of was... It was, it was to deal with a world where you had abundant renewable energy and you were potentially going to export that. But in the short to medium term, it ended up making our problems worse. So that's why we, we, we set it aside. Um, but the, uh, the problem with the Finkel review, there's nothing wrong with the Finkel review, um, but the, the, the problem with the response to the Finkel review is that its first most important recommendation was rejected. And which was to put a price on carbon. And to some degree, that really solves just about everything else because once you put a price on carbon, you see it changes the merit order of 
gas versus coal and that fixes up our, uh, our competition problem on our side of the border and also firms up our renewables. Uh, so it fixes price, emissions and reliability. And so when that was taken away, um, it, it really gutted you know, the, the report. Okay, I think we've got one up down here first, okay. <coughs> down here and then up the back. Yes. <laughs> um, this might seem like an odd question, but I'm kind of curious to know whether any of those commentators or politicians who jumped on South Australia during the blackout, whether any of them were able to reflect on their behaviour and have expressed to you <laughs> since then um, any form of regret or acknowledgement that that wasn't the appropriate way to behave? Yeah. No, I'm still waiting. I'm still waiting for the, the, the phone call. Josh doesn't call anymore. Uh, neither does neither does the prime, prime minister. No, I mean it's deeply disappointing. I mean this is one of the. Uh, I mean, it, it's interesting that the failure to take it. I mean, you, you talked before about courage and leadership on uh, taking action on climate change. I think you've got to have a lot of courage in not taking leadership on climate change because the. You know, the political uh, field is littered with the carcasses of people who, who basically ran away from their responsibilities by taking action on climate change. So I, I actually think the easy, easier decision is to, is to follow through. I mean, this is, you know, Malcolm, you know, the whole slow defenestration of Malcolm Turnbull largely occurred because he he kept capitulating on, on climate change and ultimately, I mean I must say it was one of the most brutal things I've ever heard, he kept getting him to make concession after concession and their last point was, well how can you trust this bloke, he doesn't believe in anything. <laughs> I mean, you know, they're pretty brutal up there. Okay, we're up the back this time and we've got a couple down here. First of all, I really want to thank you, yourself and your predecessor for the tremendous vision you showed in, in launching the energy transformation in Australia. My question is, how big an issue do you think it is of the market power of the three major gen tailors, and in Pacific, the one dominant gen tailor in South Australia? Oh, well, it's, it's fundamental. It's the, it's the principal cause of the, the price increases. It, it shouldn't, um, shouldn't confuse the fact that they're vertically integrated uh, with the fact that there's just too few of them. I, I don't think vertical integration is is necessarily a problem and indeed you know there's a reason we used to have things like the electricity trust of South Australia because they were vertically integrated it's there's a lot of risk in the electricity market and the more you s slice this thing everybody adds a risk premium and a profit and pretty soon you get you get to some pretty uh, ugly sort of price results so so I don't, I don't think gen tailors per se are a bad idea I think the fact that there are too few of them is the problem and the the only reason, uh, and there's too few, there's too few generators. I mean, that's the, the fundamental problem. There's not enough supply, and they're not writing enough contracts, and it's a sort of supply demand problem. And basically, what you're getting is um, insufficient competition uh, in the South Australian portion of the region. That that's the single biggest cause of the price increases. I mean, when the Northern Power Station shut, it left uh, really a well, it was only a certain proportion of the market. It was like a tipping point for prices. And once you're aware that there's nobody there competing with you on certain occasions, you can really write whatever price you like. That's really what's happening uh, with, uh, with, with these large gen tailors around the nation. What's the solution? The new generation. Who's going to build the new generation? Big question. Um, Coalition say they want to build some coal-fired power station. Labor say they want to incentivise um, um, other forms of firm generation, preferably renewables, battery, gas, solar thermal, those sorts of things. Okay, I think we've got one more up the back there and then one here halfway down and then one. Go on. Jay, you there. mentioned, um, so you mentioned writing checks. Uh, I'm just curious to hear your reasoning behind, obviously, Emergency generation, 
is important for the near term when you, you've got a shortage, but my understanding is that you had a, uh, a lease of these generators and you had the option to purchase them. Um, and given that you have, I don't know, potential increases in connection and other generation coming online, that to some the timing might look a little bit suspect that right before an, uh, an election that you go and execute that option and you lock in, you know, 30 years of operating costs and, and the like. Mm. So what yeah, you might is, share on that. This is the critique our opponents put against us. Our energy plan uh, contained the state-owned generator from day one. So it wasn't something we dreamt up just before an election. It was, it was always in our intention to have a state-owned generator. Uh, and so what we, because for the first summer we couldn't uh, get the state-owned generator built, we got two turbines that we were later clipped together as the state-owned generator uh, to operate. Uh, essentially to get us through that summer. Interestingly, the only time we, we they were ready to roll, the only time they almost got called on was Victoria almost asked us to fire them up and, and use them last summer. Um, so we, we didn't need them, but we almost needed them for us and for uh, Victoria. So it, was, it wasn't a last minute decision, it was in the plan that we announced Well, it was, all, it was always our policy. I mean, the execution of the option was a, was a, um, uh, a detail. I mean, we were always intending, it was our policy to build a state-owned generator. In fact, there was, a, there was a timing advantage as well. If we didn't execute it and start building it, when we did, we would have had to lease the generators for another summer and so we'd have blown some costs that were unnecessary to... Uh, to blow. So it was always part of our plan. I mean, it's been characterised as... See, what the, our opponents did is focus on the fact they were temporary generators. They're always purchased for the point of view of creating a permanent generation. In fact, I think when the national electricity market was created, there was... Uh, back in 1999, and there was propositions about ultimately them being privatised, it was always contemplated, or it was recommended, uh, that states retain their own reserve generation capacity. Uh, and so you've got to remember that one more blackout and we were reputationally completely, you know, shot. We just could not take the risk associated with basically further blackouts. And our projections were that there were going to be substantial shortfalls on a continuing basis. Um, that's why we chose to go down that path. OK, we're running short of time. I want to get at least three more. We've got, I think, OK, one here and one up the back. And I do want to get one down the front here. And that might have to be it. Sorry, let's... Yeah, Mr Weatherall, do you think um, we need to change probably the narrative about when we're talking about renewable energy? For example, you talked about the carbon tax. When you say carbon pricing yeah. and carbon tax, it seems like we're sort of punishing, you know, businesses or we're yeah. punishing... Um, people who are employing us. So that's, that's the tactic, obviously, yeah. uh, the LNP want to use. Do you think we should change the narrative to, like, a pollution tax and, therefore, the bad guys we focus on? Yeah. yeah not that they're bad, but we're focusing on yeah, a bad no, practice. Look, it's a good point. I mean, Labor tried to do that back in 2009. They called it the Carbon Pollution Reduction Scheme. Uh, but, I mean, Abbott is a, a great communicator and he, he was able to characterise it as a the cap-and-trade scheme as a carbon tax, and he, he won that um, communications battle. I, I think probably a safer place is to talk about renewable energy. I mean, I think renewable energy is a much more powerful um, idea in the minds of the community. And, you know, I think you can get, you can get stuck if you talk about uh, taxes. I think ultimately that plays into the hands of our political opponents. So certainly renewable energy. It's, it's interesting, there's a group of people that believe in renewable energy not just because it's action on climate change. There, there's, a, there's a group of people that actually just think it's, it's a new technology and, and this sort of some enlightenment view about the great sweep of human history and this is progress. And they see this as the next thing. So, you know, there's, there's a coalition to be built. I think the... A lot of the support for coal-fired power stations often comes from people in those communities that are worried about jobs. And I think you can... I think the communications effort there has to be about a just transition. 
so that you can actually show people that there is a future once the coal-fired power station or the coal mine closes in their community. Okay. Short and sharp now if we can. Yep, off you. Um, my name's Craig Burton. I'm an Energy Commons researcher here at the uni. Thank you for your speech. Fantastic. Um, I have a question about demand. So you've spoken about supply, yeah. supply of energy. Um, demand's variously predicted to double to 2050 by Energy Network Association, whereas the homegrown power plan, um, Ison and Lyons report, presumes a halving of demand. Do, do you have any thoughts or feelings about sort of managing demand or the risk of unmanaged demand? Yeah, look, I mean, I mean, it's another whole, it's another big topic and I haven't sort of touched on it. One thing I, I would say though, um, there's a sort of a simplistic sort of analysis which says that if we just sort of switched off our, you know, air conditioners, you know, then we wouldn't have these sort of peaks. But, you know, it's sort of rather the point. You know, people do like to have uh, those, those things available when they need them, especially vulnerable people. So. Um, I think, I mean, obviously there's an incredible amount of interesting and important work to be done on the demand side, but you know, ultimately we do have to find ways of, of, of meeting those peak demands, um, clever ways of, of, of dealing with those issues. Um, but look, I, I can't give you a comprehensive answer, otherwise we'd be here all night. Okay, I seem to have somehow promised two more when we were only going to have one, so we better make them really fast. Thanks. Just a, a, um, Sangeetha Chandrasekhar from Melbourne University. A question about the just transition. There are communities in particular places in South Australia that have been significantly affected by deindustrialisation, demise of the car manufacturing industry. Can you speak a bit more about the challenges you face as a government trying to drive the benefits of the energy trans transition in the places most in need? Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, Port Augusta is a classic example. I mean, <coughs> Port Augusta is a special place in that um, the, the community for a very long period of time have been campaigning for a renewable energy future to replace uh, the coal-fired uh, power stations. They could see what the future looked like. It was partly to do with uh, local, uh, um, local leadership. So there was a, a famous mayor who uh, was concerned about she took a view that it was un, unhealthy, the, 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 the uh, coal-fired power station. And there was another broader view that, that in the long term that we, people would turn away from coal. Um, and so it was quite a progressive, forward-looking community. And they, it's interesting, Solar Reserve is a company from the other side of the world that, that has had an interest here. Um, it's got one other plant, I think, in Nevada. And, it's a solar thermal plant, so solar um, mirrors essentially heating up molten salt. That's then a storage mechanism which allows you to generate steam, really. It's like a coal-fired power station, but you're just using the sun instead of burning coal. Now, they wouldn't have remained engaged but for the fact that the community had demonstrated such strong support for them and, and their technology that they, they saw that social licence as so valuable they stayed that course and they've used the lobbying efforts to get Commonwealth assistance, state government procurement to actually get this project um, up. So, you know, I think it, I think you, local leadership in communities, um, having some honest discussions about what the future looks like, um, about the fact that, you know, there's, there may be no long-term future, but also trying to cushion the blow so that you can move from one thing to the other. Okay, Dylan, like last. Yeah, g'day, uh, Dylan. Also, Dylan McConnell, also from the University of Melbourne. Um, I guess I just have a question about so with the the, the state-owned generation. That was, I guess, to your point that it was, um, uh, does, uh, you know, it is a state-owned reserve, and also it was not supposed to um, uh, participate or affect the uh, the market outcomes. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear your perspective on the, the South Australian Liberals' plan to uh, privatise that and how that sort of <laughs> fits in with that. Well, I mean, it's a market. You know, something if something happens in a market, it often causes something else to happen. So if a new generator comes in, uh, if they privatise the state-owned generator, uh, it could cause uh, one of these projects which are on the drawing board uh, solar thermal or Barker Inlet upgrade or Pelican Point to potentially 
uh, withdraw. Um, so you know, when governments do things, uh, the market responds. So this this may not be a, a now they might say, well, we, we'll we'll only permit it to behave in a certain fashion in the market. Well, then that will be an interesting proposition how they're actually able to construct that. It will also obviously affect its its selling price uh, as well. So I, look, I. I we has we deliberately meant, we deliberately decided it shouldn't be a market player. Um, the problem with that is it's not intuitively appealing. People think, oh, you've got a you've got a new generator. Why don't you just let it generate power, and won't that make any uh, reduced prices? Well, the problem is it will it will just it could just have a displacement effect. Somebody else could just withdraw from the market, and you don't get any net benefit. I'm going to cheat and ask you one very last one myself. Mm. It looks highly um, possible, probable at this point, that Bill Shorten, maybe Prime Minister in a matter of months, said that you're not sure a carbon price at this point would give, deliver the confidence that is required given how we, where we are and how we've got here yeah. and the market's broken. So if you've got 30 seconds to advise him on what he should do, what would you say? Uh, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I think, I, I think there are some lessons to be learnt from the South Australian Energy Plan and in particular the way in which we structured the uh, solar thermal deal. I think if markets, if markets don't believe price signals, uh, they, they still might believe contracts. And so that there's still the capacity for the for the government to to write clever contracts in a way which uh, can incentivise um, certain conduct in the market. So I mean, look, we, I mean, you, 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 to build new generation of the type that's necessary to to get the national electricity market we want, you're either going to have to pay for it yourself and have to keep writing these checks, uh, or you're going to have to use some other clever intervention. So look, th this is going to be a really tough job for the new energy minister. And I wish them all the best. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Seems a good point to finish on. Can I, um, I can tell by how warmly Jay's been received tonight, how much you appreciate him being here. I think it's been a fascinating insight in, uh, into how we got to this point and some thoughts on where to from here. So can you join me again in thanking you? Thank you. <laughs>
our, our, our new energy minister and I don't get on that well. Uh, but uh, his, first, his very first speech, he talked about South Australia as a failed experiment. Uh, clearly putting on display what, you know, just to use the phrase that we heard so much last year, putting on display the idiocy and ideology that has beset our national discussion on energy. Uh, as you've heard tonight, Jay, Jay oversaw the extraordinary, extraordinarily successful energy transition in South Australia. Over the last eight years, their emissions intensity has halved from about 600 kilos per megawatt hour of CO2 to 300. And over the next eight years, we'll see that halve again. They hit the 50% renewable energy target that the government set. They've, they've hit it already this year, two years before it was, it was uh, originally proposed. Uh, compared with a decade ago, in real terms, South Australia's energy, wholesale energy price has actually fallen. You wouldn't read about that in the papers. And the other mainland states, the price has increased. Um, South Australia is, uh, um, is, is, uh, has excellent reliability. Um, the generation system has only been caught short, that 29 minutes of generation on the 8th of February 2017. There's 27 minutes, only 100 megawatts, which was 3% of their load. Uh, and that's what so much of this fuss has been about. Mind you, that was a lack of gas generation on the day. Um, most of all, South Australia has shown us that we can solve the energy trilemma. It's sitting right underneath our nose, the reliability, uh, affordability, and emissions dimensions. So I, I predict, let's, let's talk about legacies. I predict that in, uh, in the future, we'll look back uh, on, uh, on you know, not, not on the failed experiment um, from South Australia, um, we'll, we'll consider Angus Taylor uh, to have a legacy about as, um, to have achieved about as much as Josh Frydenberg achieved while he was Energy Minister. Uh, meanwhile, meanwhile, South Australia is well on its way to 75% renewables, and then not long after that, um, many of us that read the article in, in Renew Economy that by 2025 it'll be approaching 100% net energy, net renewable energy. When the Riverland connector, uh, if and when it is built to New South Wales, energy will be flowing east to it, just as now the net flows uh, towards Victoria. Uh, and traditionally, some of the most expensive power in the country, uh, there'll be egg on many faces when, that price, when those prices become some of the cheapest and some of the lowest emitting power in the country. Uh, it'd be fair to say that in, in this crowd, Jay's a bit of a legend. Um, uh, so it's a pretty easy audience for him, uh, but I, I would like um, I'd, I'd like you all uh, in, in a second to join me uh, in recognising that Jay set a ball in motion in South Australia, and he kept pushing uh, that ball in the right direction when times got really tough, when the heat was on, uh, and gave us such um, and, and gave us such an important example, leaving an important legacy not just for South Australia. And not just for Australia, but if I can be so bold, uh, for, for the whole planet to see how a state can transition from a very dirty base to very clean over a little more than a decade. So I ask you now uh, to, to join me in thanking Jay both for his work, but for giving us a very candid and enlightening talk tonight. Cheers. <laughs> Thank you.